All right, good morning, everybody. We're dealing with the... Oh, got an echo there. There we go. Had to deal with that echo. We are dealing with the armor of the helmet today, and I think you'll be surprised that it is not anything like what you expected. Now, I am also have this new YouTube channel, Matt Crane Bible Teaching, and we have our old videos on the old channel, Truth BBB, Truth BBC Lake Oswego. You can still find the old lessons there, but the new lessons are going to be on this new channel, and also I have these lessons archived to sermon audio, and as I've mentioned, these lessons air on Fridays on Final Fight Bible Radio at 8 o'clock a.m. and 8 o'clock p.m. Pacific Time, and if you enjoy this content, uh, share it with your friends and family. Uh, subscribe and I'm gonna shoot for a 30 minute sermon length today we will see how that goes but uh, this is the fourth lesson on the armor of the devil and it wasn't really my intent initially to extend this these lessons into a series I was thinking this would be one or maybe two lessons but here we are and I hope this study uh, in spite of its length has been a blessing to you and today we're looking at again at the armor of the devil in contrast to the armor of God now certain beliefs and behaviors compose what the Bible describes as armor, if you will, just as beliefs and behaviors can be good and help to solidify good character, there are also beliefs and behaviors that can be bad and can serve to solidify bad character. By the way, I'm trying different things with the uh, audio and the microphone. We'll see how it works today. All right, so consequently, just as there is the good armor of God, there is also of necessity the bad armor of the devil, just because there are good uh, beliefs and behaviors, and there are bad beliefs and behaviors. And if this is armor, then this can be considered armor as well. And we looked at that in Luke chapter 11, in the first and second lessons. So, so far we've gone over the girdle of lies, the breastplate of unrighteousness, the shoes of bad news, uh, which is essentially merit with God earned by works. And then last week I went over the shield of skepticism. So let's get right into this next piece, which will be in contrast to the helmet of salvation. Uh, the Bible says in Ephesians 6, 17, it says, and take the helmet of salvation. Now, Paul is telling that to Christians. And in order to properly understand what the helmet of the armor of the devil is, we first need to properly understand what the helmet of the armor of God is. All right. So this helmet of salvation, generally it's explained or generally it's preached that it has to do with getting saved or, you know, thinking about the cross of Calvary and salvation and things like that. All of that is fine and good, but that's not exactly what this helmet is. This helmet of salvation, as I said, is probably not what you would expect. This is not the helmet of getting saved, nor is this the helmet of the new birth. The, that salvation of getting saved is not the salvation, the helmet of salvation mentioned here in Ephesians 6.17. The word salvation is actually used in a multitude of different ways in the Bible, one of which is the salvation of your soul, which occurred when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Uh, but that salvation, as we would call it, is not the salvation referred to here, and I'm going to explain why. There are a few reasons why this is the case. Number one, and the most obvious reason, is Paul is telling these Ephesians here at Ephesus that they need to put on this helmet implying that they might not have it on already. Now, he's speaking to a saved, born-again audience. If this helmet is the helmet of getting saved, then all of those Ephesians should already have that helmet, right? And every Christian, for that matter, should automatically have the helmet of salvation. As a matter of fact, no Christian would ever need to put this helmet on because it would have been put on him, if you will, the, the day he got saved. And it would essentially have been even super glued onto his head because as a Christian, you can't lose your salvation. Now again, we're dealing with the helmet of salvation. And if, you th and if you're under the impression that the helmet of salvation has to do with getting saved, right, then technically you would have got that helmet the day you got saved, and uh, you would never have to worry about putting it on because it would already be on. All right, so that's a problem. If Paul is telling these saved Christians they need to put on this helmet, that tells you something. That tells you that it's not the new birth salvation that he's referring to here. Uh, because a Christian evidently can go around without the helmet of salvation on. 
right? Okay, so uh, number two, this helmet is mentioned again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and comparing Scripture with Scripture, that'll help us understand what exactly this helmet is that Paul is referring to. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I'm going to go ahead and turn there, and if you can beat me there, great, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, notice what this helmet is called. The Bible says, but let us who are of the day, speaking to Christians, be sober, putting on the breastplate of... Now notice that it doesn't say the breastplate of righteousness. It says the, bre the breastplate of faith and love. Here he's speaking to the Thessalonians, a different audience, but still born-again Christians, and he refers to the breastplate. He's not going through all of the armor, but he refers to the breastplate, and you say, well, I thought the breastplate was a breastplate of righteousness. And here in 1 Thessalonians 5, it's a breastplate of faith and love. What's up with that? Well, the fact of the matter is, the Bible says in Romans 3.22 that uh, our righteousness is by the faith of Jesus Christ. All right, And then also the Bible says that love is the fulfilling of God's moral laws in Romans 13.10. So when it comes to righteousness, if you want to break down what the elements of righteousness are, it is, in essence, faith and love, right? <laughs> so the, calling it the breastplate of righteousness is the same thing as calling it the breastplate of faith and love. You see, the, he gives you two different passages describing the same thing using different terminology so that you can understand what you're dealing with. Now he's going to do the same thing with the helmet. He says, And let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. He says for a helmet, we're supposed to put on the helmet of the hope of salvation. So that elaborates on that helmet a little bit more than what you have there in Ephesians chapter 6. Now again, uh, the salvation here, the hope of salvation, is not the salvation that you get when you believe the gospel. Okay, so we have to kind of, a lot of times Christians see that word salvation and they instantly think of getting saved or getting born again. That's not the way the word is used here. Otherwise, there would be the helmet of, I hope I'm saved. And we're not to be going around as Roman Catholics saying, I hope I'm saved. You know, you ask a Roman Catholic, I just asked one a few days ago, if you die tonight, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven when you die? And he says, well, I hope so. I hope I'm saved. I hope I'll go to heaven when I die. But nobody can know for sure. That's the typical Catholic answer. And the reason why they answer that way is because they're not saved and they don't know for sure where they're going when they die. They hope uh, to make purgatory or even uh, heaven, but uh, they, they're never sure. Why is that? Because they ha they're trusting in their own works and trying to have faith. And that's not the gospel. That's a false gospel. That's why Catholics aren't Christians, technically. They're not followers of Christ. They're followers of the Roman Catholic religion. They're followers of the Pope. But uh, anyway, this, is, this helmet of the hope of salvation, that's not talking about, I hope I'm saved, or I hope I go to heaven, because that's not what the Bible teaches. Um, if, you're, if you believe what God said, if you believe the Bible and you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you know you're saved. Because God can't lie, right? And He said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now, either God's a liar, or He's not. And if you're just going to take God at His word, then you can know for sure that you're saved by simply reading the Bible and say, Well, I've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, and God said if I did that and I put my trust in Christ, I am saved. That's all there is to it. It's very simple. It has to do with faith. Right? The Bible says in 1 John 5.13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Not hope that ye have eternal life. Not, not wish or, or uh, be uncertain if you do or don't. The Bible says, These things have, we, have I written unto you that ye may know that ye have eternal life. 1 John 5.13. So what we're dealing with here today has to do with terminology in your King James Bible, that word salvation. Even though our society is being drastically dumbed down and, uh, by our education system, we need to not bring this Bible down to our level. We need to do what the Bible says and study to show ourselves approved unto God, study the Word of God, and try to raise our intellect up to the level of the Bible, or at least <laughs> close to it. In other words, don't change the Bible just because you don't know how to look how to use a dictionary. Just use the dictionary, and you'll find that there are more than one word, one way the word salvation is uh, uh, defined. So most English words, like I've said, have more than one meaning, and the same is true of the words salvation and the word hope. 
salvation, the word salvation is simply being saved from or delivered from something. something. And the reason why we use the word salvation in terms of the gospel and getting saved is because, you know, that's the greatest salvation there is, salvation from hell salvation or being delivered from the penalty of your sins and so that's why we use it in that context for the most part but there are a lot of things that a person can be saved or be delivered from for example the old testament jews were saved from their neighboring enemies by men like gideon ehud othniel and so on and those judges back in the book of judges were called quote saviors nehemiah 9:27 the book of Judges could also be called the book of saviors, according to Nehemiah 9.27. Why? Because they saved Israel from their enemies. It has nothing to do with Jesus dying on the cross for anybody's sins. It has nothing to do with uh, salvation by grace through faith, right? It just has to do with somebody's uh, being attacked or being in bondage to their enemies, and someone comes along and saves them from their enemies, okay? Um, the waters of the Red Sea overthrowing Pharaoh's army was called, quote, the salvation of the Lord, Exodus 14, 13. And that had nothing to do with Jesus Christ dying on a cross for someone's sins, but that was called the, quote, salvation of the Lord. You see what I mean? Why? Because God saved Israel from Pharaoh and his army by overthrowing them in the Red Sea. All right. Paul getting out of jail is called salvation in Philippians chapter 1, verse 19. So you see, there's a lot of different ways that the word salvation can be used in the Bible, and there's a lot of things that a person can be saved from. Supposedly, you can get saved from high insurance costs by switching to Geico. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. I don't have Geico, but I'm told that you can save a lot of money by <laughs> switching. So there's a lot of different ways that you can uh, be saved. As Christians, we have already been saved from hell, but there is one more enemy that we have yet to be saved from. Do you know who that enemy is? The, that enemy, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 26, is death. The Bible says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. All right. So you are saved from the second death, if you will, which is defined as death in the lake of fire, death in hell. Uh, according to Revelation chapter 20, you are saved from that second death from going to hell when you trusted in Christ. But the first death, which is physical death, is still a problem. So you are saved from the second death, the death of your soul when you got saved. But you still need to be saved from death, the death of your physical body, because all of us are going to die someday uh, unless something drastic happens. <laughs> All right? So that salvation, the salvation from physical death, is what we Christians are still looking forward to. This, that salvation is the salvation of the rapture, as we would call it, or the salvation of the resurrection. Okay. Either way, whether you're caught up, uh, whether you're alive and caught up in the clouds, or whether your body is dead and in the grave and called up out of the ground when the Lord returns, either way, that is deliverance or that is salvation from the enemy of physical death. Now, turn to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. I'm going to show you something here in the way these words are used in your Bible. Romans chapter 13, and if you look at verse 11. Uh, Paul is speaking, and he says, And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Wait a second, I thought you got saved when you believed. I mean, in, essentially what Paul is saying is here is, Now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we got saved. So you see, there's two different salvations being mentioned there in that passage. You have the salvation of your soul when you believe on Jesus Christ, but then Paul's saying there's another salvation that's coming that we have not yet attained to, and the salvation that he's referring there in that passage is the return of Jesus Christ, the salvation of your body, right? The redemption of your body, okay? So... Uh, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9, that we have already received uh, the, the end of our faith, even the salvation of our souls when we trusted Jesus Christ. And yet Paul says there's another salvation that we're still waiting for. And it's nearer. It's near. It's not here yet, but it's coming. What salvation is that? 
That's the salvation of our body. All right? So there are two salvations for the Christian, essentially. The salvation of your soul at the time of belief on Christ, and the salvation of your body at the time of the return of Christ, which we give the label of the rapture. Okay? So when it comes to my soul, I do not hope for salvation, if you will, uh, because I already have that. And when it comes to my body, I do hope for that. I do hope for that salvation. The hope of salvation, uh, the helmet of the hope of salvation is not the hope of salvation for my soul. It's the hope of salvation for my body. I am anticipating the rapture. But if that doesn't happen in my lifetime, I am expecting the resurrection. All right, which segues us to that word hope real quick. In our modern vernacular, we use the word hope in modern usage. We tend to use the word hope as, as an uncertain wish, like I hope this happens, or I hope I get this raise. Like we don't know if it will or won't, but it's an uncertain wish that we have. Whereas the Bible usage of the word hope is a confident expectation. Something that we know for sure is going to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. That's the way the Bible uses the word hope, a confident expectation. The Bible says in Philippians 1.19, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation, which in the context is deliverance from jail. Paul says, I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And he says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope. You see that? That tautology there where two words are uh, used that are synonymous. He uses two words that are essentially the same thing. He says, my expectation and my hope. Same thing, synonymous. That in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. So one way or the other, whether I get out of jail, you know, alive or whether I get out of jail dead, one way or the other, I'm getting out of jail. <laughs> that was Paul's confident expectation. He knew he was going to get out of that jail cell one way or the other. Now, when Paul was being taken to Rome, uh, they hit a big storm. And the Bible says there in Acts chapter 27, verse 20, it says this, And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Now, obviously, Paul there is not talking about, you know, he's worried that he's lost his salvation or something like that. Basically, what he's saying there is any expectation of being delivered from that storm or any expectation of surviving that storm was lost among the crew. That's the way the word hope is used there and the way the word saved is used there. Okay, so you see how these ways these terms are used. So the helmet of salvation could also be called the helmet of the expectation. Okay, if we use this terminology, technically it'd be right. The helmet of the expectation of Christ's return or the helmet of the expectation of the rapture. Or if you said the helmet of the expectation, you could say that. You could call it the helmet of the hope of salvation. You could call it the helmet of hope. You could call it uh, the helmet of looking forward to the rapture. Or you could call it the rapture helmet if you wanted to, because that is, ex that is what that's talking about. The hope of salvation. That's the salvation of your body. That takes place at the rapture. So this is the helmet of the hope of the rapture. The helmet of the not the uncertain wish, like maybe the rapture will happen, maybe it won't. It's the expectation that Jesus Christ is going to return again. So it's the helmet of the expectation of the rapture. You see that? Now, maybe you've never looked at that helmet of salvation that way before, but that's what that's talking about. All right? And this definition explains why Paul is telling the Ephesian Christians to put this helmet on, implying that it doesn't come standard issue when you get saved. And a born-again Christian who has no thought of the Lord's soon return is a Christian who is without a helmet. And the Bible says in regards to looking forward to Christ's return, the Bible says in 1 John 3, verse 3, every man that hath this hope in him, this expectation in the context of the return of Christ, every man that has this expectation of the Lord's return in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. 
So anticipating the Lord's soon return does have an effect in your life. It has a cleansing effect. Why? Why is that? Well, it's because you realize that Jesus Christ could come back at any time, even while you're doing something evil. How would you like that? How would you like Jesus Christ to return when you're watching something just totally trashy? How would you like the Lord to return when you're doing something with someone that you know you shouldn't be doing? Right? Jesus Christ could come back at any time, and if you have that mentality, if you have that understanding and knowledge and belief in your head, it's going to have a cleansing effect in your life. Uh, it'll also cleanse your life because you know that, if, that uh, when Jesus returns, everything that you own will be left behind. That'll have an, a cleansing effect in your life. It'll help you to not be so focused on things down here and on the riches of this world. You also realize that when Jesus returns, all of your worldly ambitions will come to an end. So that might help you to reorient uh, your ambitions, your, your, uh, the, your priorities, rearrange, cause you to rearrange your priorities. Uh, you also realize that uh, when Jesus Christ returns, if you know the Bible, you know that what follows His return is the judgment seat of Christ. And you'll start thinking about that judgment seat of Christ and want, to, and want to be prepared for that. And you'll think about the rewards that are involved or the rebuke that might be involved if uh, you've lived a disobedient life for Jesus Christ. Or a, a disobedient life for yourself or whether you've lived an obedient life for Jesus Christ. All right? So the helmet of salvation or the helmet of the rapture or the helmet of the return of Christ, whatever you want to call it, is a helmet that gets your head in the right spot. It helps you to set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. The helmet of the rapture, the helmet of the hope of Christ's return, helps you to lay hold on the concept of eternal life, like it says there in 1 Timothy 6.12. Lay hold on eternal life. Lay, mentally get a hold of that thing of eternal life. Get a, get a grip of it. Get that concept in your mind. It helps you to focus your mind on the sweet by and by as opposed to the nasty now and now, as they say. Uh, it reminds you that only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's what that helmet does, and that's why as a Christian you need to have that helmet on, and you might not have that helmet on today, but you need to put it on. All right, now that we, now, now again, the, the lessons today are not the the lessons on the armor of God. <laughs> These lessons are on the armor of the devil. Okay, but we had to find out what exactly this helmet was in relation to the armor of God before we can find out what it is in relation to the armor of the devil. All right. So now that we know what it is, we can properly identify its counterpart. And essentially, this helmet. I'm just going to give it a long title here. We could call it the helmet of uh, damnation. But again, that would kind of give you the wrong impression compared to what we're looking at. So this is essentially the helmet of uh, the denial of Christ's return. And I'll clean this, uh, this verbiage up next week to make it look a little better. But uh, if this helmet on the good side is the expectation, the anticipation of Christ's return, then the opposite of that is going to be the denial of Christ's return. Okay? And it's interesting when you think about this, and this covers a broad spectrum, because on the far end of the spectrum, you have people who deny the doctrine of Christ's return to the extent that they think it's total fantasy, and anyone who believes in it has a mental illness, all right? And this would be the position of an unsaved, materialistic atheist, okay? So they have uh, this helmet on, which prevents them from ever even thinking that it could be possible that Jesus Christ could return, because they don't even believe in Jesus, all right? So their head is blocked off <laughs> from any kind of thoughts uh, along these lines. But then you have Christians who have this helmet of the armor of the devil on. They have the helmet, the, the Christians, born-again Christians, have the helmet of the denial of Christ's return, and it has, that belief has an effect on their behavior. Because you have Christians today who don't know about the truth of the rapture, and you have Christians today, today who don't believe in the truth of the rapture. And by the way, the doctrine of the rapture is a Bible truth, okay? It's very clear, very clearly laid out in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and if you rightly divide the word of truth, the doctrine of the rapture is not some, uh, some 
crazy uh, teaching that was invented in the 1800s by Darby and his uh, epileptic daughter or something like that. Okay, It was nothing like that. These things have been written this whole time, and whether or not people fully understood it, you know, is beside the point. I mean, after all, most Christians didn't even own a copy of the Scriptures for hundreds of years, okay? So, it's only in these last 200 years that the body of Christ has really been able to uh, study this book, have a copy of it for themselves, be able to even have a concordance to compare Scriptures with Scriptures. So, it's, it's, no, uh, it's no great thing that maybe the body of Christ didn't fully understand these things, although there is proof and there is uh, documentation that there were Christians back in the early, uh, I think it's 300s, 400s, who understood the doctrine of the rapture. So this idea that it's a new teaching that, you know, a new false teaching that's come out in the last 200 years is not true. But anyway, that's another subject for another time. So there so when it comes to Christians who don't believe in the return of Jesus Christ, who don't believe in the rapture, you have the uh, first off, you have the doctrine of postmillennialism which denies the doctrine, the biblical doctrine of the rapture. Postmillennialism is what it's called. Postmillennialism is essentially the idea that mankind is going to bring in a utopia. Mankind is going to bring about peace on earth. And once that finally happens, then Jesus will come. Maybe, maybe he won't. Um, or maybe Jesus never physically returns. He just returns in spirit. And uh, the world lives in the prosperous global consciousness of the Christ spirit. It, which, by the way, is becoming a uh, pretty popular teaching these days, which is very strange. Uh, this idea that, you know, conservatives and Christians are going to do all these good things and bring about, you know, peace and prosperity on earth. And then, you know, uh, we'll have that peace and prosperity for a thousand years. Some people teach it that way. And then maybe Jesus will come back after that. That's post-millennialism. Okay? Consequently... Christians who believe postmillennial teaching uh, have all of their attention focused on the things of the earth. And you'll notice that this, hel this helmet has to do with the expectation of the Lord's return, which has to do with looking up for your redemption draweth nigh. If you don't have that helmet and you have the wrong helmet on your head, you're going to be looking down, which is what postmillennialism does. Con Christians who are postmillennialists focus on the things of this earth. Their emphasis is not on spreading the gospel, it is on spreading democracy. And their focus is on bringing world peace through politics. And their emphasis is on humanitarian aid and social change. All right. Now, I am not saying that those things are bad. I'm not. The Bible believer has to be careful about being reactionary and swinging the pendulum too far the other way. Humanitarian aid, moral improvement in society, and trying to bring about good and just laws through proper political channels in your community is all fine and good. That's, that's perfectly fine. But as premillennial Bible believers, we understand that, yes, the nations will align with the Antichrist eventually. All nations will. And the world in general is going to get worse and worse and worse before Jesus comes. And Jesus is going to have to perform his own great reset before anything is going to be truly fixed. All right. Now, that doesn't mean that we should just give up, throw our hands in the air, and, well, everything's going to go to hell anyway, so what's the point in trying? When has that ever been the Christian doctrine in the Bible? You know, every, well, it's not going to do any good, so what's the point in trying? You know, that wasn't Jesus' attitude. Well, they're just going to crucify me, so what's the point? <laughs> you know, it's not like that. Uh, we, just because uh, things are going downhill doesn't mean that we should give up any efforts to bring about any kind of positive moral change in society. But it does mean that as Bible believers, we should have a balanced outlook and that we should always keep the spreading of the gospel first and foremost. All right? So a premillennial viewpoint... Uh, in your theology keeps your eyes looking up, whereas a post-millennial viewpoint of theology keeps your eyes looking down. And I have one minute until it's 30 minutes. Actually, I've got like two minutes, three minutes. We'll see what happens. Post-millennialism uh, removes the helmet of the rapture from the Christian's head because the post-millennialist doesn't believe in a rapture. Post-millennialism is not just simply a difference of opinion. It is a false teaching that places uh, the completely wrong helmet on the Christian's head. 
a Christian who is a post-millennialist, and I'm not, and there can be some saved Christians who are post-millennialists. Just because a person is saved doesn't mean that that is going to prevent them from believing false doctrine. A person can get saved, truly believe in Jesus Christ, and get messed up down the road. But this helmet of the denial of Christ's return has to do with that helmet of post-millennialism, or if you hear guys talking about, you know, the Christ consciousness coming, you know, and all that Q movement, how we're going to bring in this new golden era and all this stuff, which, you know, there could be great prosperity coming, but uh, it's, it's uh, you got to watch out for some of that deception. But anyway, it's not going to be this post-millennial, post-millennial thing where you bring in great peace and prosperity through politics and all that stuff. What that does is it's the denial of Christ's return. They, they're not thinking about the fact that Jesus Christ has to come back and fix this mess. They think, we'll fix it ourselves, right? So that's a problem. And it changes the mentality that you have. It changes your outlook on the world and on life, and you've got to be careful about that. So another interesting thing worth considering is the teaching of the post-tribulation rapture. And this is a popular teaching that says the church is going to go through the prophesied tribulation period. And there are some variations to this teaching. Some say that the church is going to be raptured at the very end of the Great Tribulation. And some say that the church will be raptured halfway through the tribulation and won't be around for the final three and a half years. But uh, these Christians are looking forward to Christ's return. Let's just be honest. I'm not going to completely throw these post-tribulation people under the bus. They are looking forward to Christ's return, uh, but between them and the return of Christ is the tribulation period in their, th- in their thinking. And between them and the return of Christ is the Antichrist and also the mark of the beast. So naturally, they tend to look down at the things of this world as opposed to looking up because they have no expectation of being delivered from the tribulation period or the wrath to come. Uh, so they naturally, what, what is the natural thing with that? If you aren't looking forward to Jesus Christ returning and saving you from this present evil world, you know, and you have, have this expectation that I've got to survive the tribulation, and I've got to not take the mark of the beast, and I've got to survive the Antichrist's attacks. Well, what is naturally going to happen? Well, naturally, there's going to be a tendency to hoard food, build bomb shelters and un- underground bunkers. There's going to be a tendency to want to hoard ammo and uh, prepare so that they can survive the tribulation period and endure to the end, like Jesus says in Matthew 24, 13. They want to have enough food saved up <coughs> so that they won't be tempted to take the mark of the beast because at that time people won't be able to buy or sell and uh, they want to have their bug out kits ready so that when they see the antichrist uh, stand in the holy place on cnn they'll be ready to flee into the wilderness (laughs) and uh, if the post-tribulation theory rapture was true who could blame someone a christian for wanting to prepare i mean the mentality makes perfect sense in that context And if they're right about the post-tribulation rapture, then what they're doing makes perfect sense. The problem is they're not rightly dividing the word of truth. They don't make any doctrinal separation between Israel and the church. And they don't make any doctrinal separation between church age salvation, Old Testament salvation, or tribulation salvation. And their misunderstanding of the Bible results in misinterpretation of the scriptures and a total blindness to the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture as it is explained in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 as it is typified in Revelation chapter 4. And so consequently, the mentality of these people then shifts from eagerly anticipating Christ's coming to anxiously awaiting the Antichrist's coming. And those two differences of belief are going to have drastic changes in behavior. Remember, this armor is all about belief and behavior. What you believe has a lot to do with how you live. And the helmet of the expectation of Christ's return, or the helmet of the... Let me just put it this way. How do you like the? How do you like this? The helmet of the pre-tribulation... Rapture. (laughs) The helmet of the armor of God is the helmet of the pre-tribulation rapture. Okay? That helmet has a positive, purifying effect in the Christian's life. The helmet of the denial of Christ's return, or the helmet of the post-tribulation rapture, has a worrisome, weakening effect on the Christian's life. 
because they're fearful of what's coming. And rightfully so. Jesus said it's going to be worse than the days of Noah. <laughs> so, uh, the, the false teaching of the post-tribulation rapture breeds hopelessness and fearfulness, fearfulness, knowing that we won't be delivered from this world and will probably be horribly destroyed since over half of the world's population will be wiped out at that time. Praise the Lord. <laughs> right? But the truth of the pre-tribulation rapture gives us hope of salvation and expectation of deliverance from this present evil world. And what a blessing to know that we're not going to go through the wrath of God being poured out on the earth. He's delivered us from the wrath to come. And who knows? Maybe it'll be today. Now, as I've said before, based on some things I see in the Bible... I think we still have a few years to go before the Lord returns, but I'm not dogmatic about that, and I still think that the Lord could surprise His bride with His coming at any time He wants. Okay? So, the bottom line is, the Bible teaches that our Lord and Savior is coming back and is coming soon. And when that is believed, received, and understood, that brings about a positive, practical change in our Christian life. And when that truth of Christ's return is denied, or even ignored, or completely misunderstood through post-millennialism or a post-tribulation rapture theology... What happens is that brings about a negative change in our lives. Okay? Maybe you now now and I've explained all that. Now let me say let me close with this. Maybe you do believe in a pre-tribulation rapture and that Christ could come at any time. And maybe you do subscribe to that in your head, but that truth hasn't really settled in your heart. As I said last week, you can believe in right doctrines, but that doesn't mean that you are necessarily wearing that Christian armor. Simply saying that you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture doesn't automatically mean that you have that helmet on. Do you truly believe in the Lord's soon return? Not just in your head, but in your heart do you believe that? Do you meditate on the possibility that Jesus Christ could come in your lifetime? Do you, cons do you consciously consider what the ramifications of that would be if that did happen. Does the truth of Jesus' soon return cause you to behave differently? That is what the helmet of salvation is. That is what the helmet of salvation does. You might intellectually subscribe to a pre-tribulation rapture, but for all practical purposes, you may be living as though he's never coming back. And in reality... You, as a Christian, a born-again Christian, are wearing the helmet of the denial of Christ's return. And you might be wearing the helmet of the armor of the devil. So consider which helmet is on your head this morning, and if you need to switch helmets, then do so. Got done quickly this morning, praise God. I hope you got something from this lesson, and God bless you. Have a good week.